the wall of randomness. How random phenomena disseminate. Vendelin Verne, Université Paris Sud. 20 years ago, I came to Berlin to celebrate New Year's at the Brandenburg Gate. So, uh, good afternoon. So, you've noticed that there was a switch of uh, speakers, uh, but uh, you will get to see the initially uh, 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 planned speaker just next because I see that he just arrived. So, um, my, my uh, lecture today is, of course, a bit special because, uh, okay, I'm the mathematician here. So, what can a mathematician try to convey as general ideas about mathematical results or recent mathematical results uh, to a general audience? And, um, and of course, the first question that we are, have to ask, uh, given if we see all the nice applications and great uh, uh, things, uh, prospects that uh, we heard from uh, this morning early on, which has to do what, why are we doing mathematics? And um, the first answer is that actually we mathematicians don't really know. Uh, we, we know uh, for sure sometimes it has been proved to be useful and uh, it has sort of uh, turned out to be uh, uh, very important uh, and uh, so that things that didn't seem to have any possible applications turned out to uh, have a lot of applications uh, later on. And maybe one, one thing that strikes me when I heard the, this morning is, and this afternoon's talks is that in a way what we are doing is that we are asking very, very simple questions. So we are modest in, in the type of uh, questions that we are asking. Of course, we choose the simple questions in such a way that the answers have to be difficult, otherwise it's, 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 not, it's not fun. Uh, and in a way you could say that what we try to do is to understand some sort of a very complicated structures that have a sort of infinite complexity in some way and we try to master them by abstract uh, constructions and to, to give them an abstract meaning. Uh, for, of course the simplest example is that of prime numbers. So uh, uh, the set of prime numbers is, is very simple to describe yet it has sort of a, it's not a, something you can sort of encode by an algorithmic way. It's a, it's a set with an infinite complexity Nevertheless, there are a number of things you can say and sort of many results, even recent ones, have to do with the fact that this set, you know, there are not enough prime numbers uh, in such a way that uh, to construct uh, prime numbers with certain features. And um, so still, this infinite set with infinite complexity, you can say things about it. And sometimes you have to construct, in order to understand and master this, you have to construct very elaborate uh, sort of uh, theories uh, uh, that unfortunately are hard to convey to a general audience. So my, my uh, specialty has to do with probability theory, so randomness. And the, the first thing I would like to say about randomness is um, when we do study sort of random or probability theory and random behavior as mathematicians, we don't think about whether this is a good model uh, for reality or what is really random and what isn't. There's just a simple sort of postulate about what is a random event uh, as an abstract object, and then we work with that and say something with this. Um, and of course, as I said, we want to study systems with in infinite sort of a large complexity. So in some sense, we want to study infinite, uh, I mean, co systems consisting of infinitely many uh, random things, or alternatively speaking, sort of systems where you have a, a very, very large number of co random inputs. And of course, uh, this has many motivations, and a lot of what I'm going to say comes from physics and statistical physics, uh, because you might say that you know, on small scale, things are uh, maybe random, I don't know, but uh, nevertheless, we are looking at uh, large scale uh, systems and uh, consisting of many sort of small scale inputs that can be viewed as random. So, of course, the simplest question, and you will see maybe this lecture will be slightly different than the. <laughs> Uh, other ones because uh, probably it will be slower uh, and uh, also um, the questions are really much more modest. So uh, the, the simplest question of course has to do with, uh, uh, you know, we have a very large sequ long sequence of head, uh, I mean head and tail tosses, you toss a coin many times, 
And uh, you ask question about, you know, how many tails do you see when you do uh, one million uh, uh, coin tosses? And, um, and usually you have two main answers that uh, are taught uh, at university, you know, about this, and this is the law of large numbers and the central limit theorem. And so I just show you the, 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 what they mean in, in sort of in pictures. So this is the picture you see if basically you toss a coin at each step in time, moving to the right, you go up or down with probability 50%. So, you, you toss, so basically this one has to, tossed twice uh, heads and then once tails and so on. So this is what happens, uh, an example of what you toss if you do it nine, for nine people, I mean nine times, and if you do it sort of 1,600 times, and you still keep this uh, horizontal vertical sort of same shape, meaning that you go up by 45 degrees or down by 45 degrees at each step, you start seeing something which, even though it's random, looks pretty much like a straight line. Um, and basically, the longer the line, sort of the, the straight it looks from far away. Intuitively, it's clear, the law of large numbers basically saying to you that, roughly speaking, after a very long time, the proportion of heads and of tails is roughly 50%. And therefore, they average out in, into a straight line. Now, what the central limit theorem is doing is basically what you do is you zoom in, you stretch this previous curve vertically until you start seeing something. And if you stretch this vertical curve, I mean, you stretch this picture vertically sort of enough until you start seeing something, this is the type of picture you see. And so this is, looks pretty much like a, sort of a continuous curve, sort of a, a, something that moves continuously and that Intuitively, you might say at each step, sort of choose it to go up or down uh, at infinite speed, sort of, uh, but changes its, its, uh, its uh, opinion all the time. And so this is a picture of a continuous random curve that we call Brownian motion. Uh, and uh, this type of theory about Brownian motion or Gaussian random variable has met, had, had numerous and successful applications. Well, successful, I don't know, but numerous applications. So, of course, for opinion polls, uh, this is useful. Um, in physics, of course, uh, this has come from, I mean, from physics. In math finance, well, this is maybe debatable. Uh, and, and um, well, at least it looked like uh, uh, pretty much like the type of picture you see uh, when you open the newspapers on the, the page uh, towards the end where you, if you're a scientist, uh, you are, don't look at this because you are concerned about how your stocks are doing, but uh, because you usually don't have any. But uh, basically, um, or branching processes or uh, other uh, questions. And maybe I, I would like to, to emphasize one thing about feature about Brownian motion, uh, which has to do with this type of randomness we are seeing here, which is that it's, in a way, it's stable. It is stable because if you imagine that you resample 5% five, 5 of the coin tosses. Another way is to say the following that, you know, the machine that collects the results of your coin tosses, 5% of the time it has it wrong. It reads the wrong thing. It doesn't do it on purpose, but it's as if you resample 5% of, of, your, of, of your coin tosses. Basically, the true picture uh, and the modified one that you actually see are pretty close. So, in some sense, this is stable, and it's... Uh, so, if the, if the answer to your question is... You, your question asks, are there more heads than tails? If you see 95% of the results, you already have a good idea whether what the answer at the end will be. And in a way, you can say it like this, that one individual basically has no influence uh, to the outcome. Or even a small, uh, you know, uh, individual results don't have sort of a lot of influence about what uh, is going to happen next. Now, I want just to show you now another model, which is called percolation, which comes from physics, and uh, which is basically the same question. You toss coins many times, but this time, Basically, each cell is going to color in black and white according, uh, by tossing an independent coin. So actually, you're not interested in this picture, but you're interested in this one, right? Or uh, maybe even worse. So you have this gray television screen with uh, many uh, bits, each one being white and, or, or black. And the question you are asking about this has to do with basically a question like, you know, is there a long connection of white cells from one side to the other? So one way would be to say, well, imagine that sort of the white guys are immune, the black ones are the, the ones that are sort of uh, immunizate, uh, I mean, uh, that, no, the black cells would be immune, the white one would be the one that sort of uh, could uh, be infected, and then you have an infection on the red, on, on the 
left side of the screen, and you ask the question, how far does it go? And so here, maybe some of you played uh, games like this, but uh, there's this simple uh, game uh, which says the following. If you take a rhombus, um, and yes, like this, and you color this size white, white here, and this size black, black, basically uh, either you have black wins and manages to uh, make a black crossing merging the two black regions, or if it doesn't, that means that white won and managed to block black. So in a way, here this is a one winner uh, situation. Either black wins by connecting its two sides, and or white wins by connecting its two sides. And this is true at any scale. So if you take the previous picture and you cut out sort of a big rhombus here uh, in, then you have 50% chances of having a white crossing uh, in one direction. So this suggests very strongly the fact that these crossing events, or the crossing sort of probabilities, are random at any scale and any large scale you want. And so that you have objects like look like this, which are the islands, you know, connected islands of infected cells, will look like this. And their shape looks pretty random. Now, the important feature I want to explain to you now is that this system is not stable. So imagine that this is a, 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 I mean a, a family of connected cells. And now I, put, I shake it a little bit by perturbing 5% of the cells of the outcome. And, and then you get this answer instead of the previous one. Right? Or I reshake it again, and I get another one. And basically what happens is by cha changing a very small proportion of the state of the cells, you completely change the macroscopic uh, behavior and the answer to your question becomes completely different. So why is that? Basically because uh, in a large system, basically you have plenty of crucial of cells that will turn out in the end to have all the power. They are crucial. You see these yellow cells for the question of whether black or white wins in this picture. Basically, they have all the power and to decide who wins. Because if any of the yellow cells would have, have been black, then black would have won. And so in a, what the type of thing we sort of understand now has to do with the, basically you take a, I don't know, 10,000 by 10,000 uh, box that basically, roughly speaking, uh, you will have around, I mean, the order of magnitude of, of yellow cells will be of order 1,000. So that means you have th about 1,000 individual they didn't know it at first, that they will have to be singled out to contain have to, all the information. But they are the ones who have all the power, so somehow, to decide about the, the outcome of this game. So now I just want to show you a little picture. So imagine that you have an infection on the bottom side. Blue is the infected guy. And so this is if you have blue, few blue cells. So that's if your coin toss is not 50%, but it's a, uh, sort of, a, this would be 25% of blue and 75% and, and of green. And imagine the bottom is infected, and basically the red curve is the topmost, is, is the boundary of the set of, uh, topmost boundary of the set of infected guys. So, of course, if you have 75% of blue cells, then everything is infected. And now I just show, and this is the red curve that you see if you toss exactly a, a fair coin. So you see that the the structure of the set of infected cells and the uppermost boundary is very weird and hard to understand. Now, just show you the movie, now I increase the proportion of blue cells, and what you see here is that somehow, you know, near this phase transition point, and that's why physicists were interested in this because it has to do with phase transitions, basically this, you know, this red curve sort of jumps, moves up by jumps, and uh, this is uh, what you see. So to conclude, I want to say two things. So the first is that this gave you a real glimpse of what the type of random structures that as mathematicians we try now to understand sort of rigorously and put our hands on about the continuous underlying structure that is behind this. Maybe I should just say one word, which is that the mathematics that are behind have to do with complex analysis. And uh, complex analysis is one of the fields that uh, has been where Berlin had a very strong influence in the 19th century uh, with you know, great uh, mathematicians. Most of uh, uh, many important things in, in this field happened uh, here. And um, somehow understanding some toy models like this, the previous one, still uh, changes the way we understand uh, multi-scale random phenomena around us. So now to conclude, I, no need, I, I'm just done. I just show you one picture because I want to say that um, uh, 
this person here, which is uh, very dear to my heart, is Odette Schramm. And uh, basically, uh, he's a mathematician, who, a good friend of mine, who passed away uh, last year by, uh, in a climbing accident. And I want just to say that uh, doing mathematics is about uh, mathematicians and people like this. Um, and uh, also that uh, we've probably found out that our grandfathers may have played Skat together uh, in Berlin uh, about 70 years ago, and, uh, or 75 years ago. And uh, uh, I'm glad uh, to show you this picture of this very uh, nice uh, person and uh, to conclude my talk here. Thank you.